Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you as always here in Watchhorn. Uh, I'm due to be at Watchhorn tomorrow morning as well at 10.30. That'll be a local meeting. Everyone's welcome, but of course we encourage people to attend their own fellowship if they have one. If you don't, you're more than welcome and encouraged to join us tomorrow here at Watchhorn. Uh, today we will have two sessions. Uh, and they'll both be concerned with the return of Christ, with the second coming of Jesus, with our blessed hope. Hi, come in, have a seat. We'll be looking at those two subjects today. Um, right now, we have a, a church affiliated with our ministry in uh, Wolverhampton that's been evicted from a chapel it rented, at least from the Anglicans, at least a chapel. And the Anglicans have evicted us, uh, will not continue the lease, and their reason is because the church is mainly Asian people, it's mainly Asian believers, um, save that of Hinduism, Sikhism, maybe a few Muslims, things like that. But because the church says it stands with the prophetic purposes of God for Israel, and therefore they're booted out. They found a place temporarily to meet. In the meantime, the Lord has given them what they need, but they just, that's the reason they got booted out of the, of the property. Tomorrow night, I'm speaking at a church in Winsford. That church in Winsford is a Pentecostal church. It left the Assemblies of God in the aftermath of the laughing and drunken scandal of 15, 20 years ago, the counterfeit revival. And there was a big legal battle and legal threats over the propriety of the building. The Lord gave them the victory. They finally got the building, but that's tomorrow. But those are churches associated with Moriel, that are affiliated with our ministry, in which I have some input. This church, I am only a visitor, a guest. I have friends who go to it. I have friends in the leadership, but it's just a church that I like. However, I do want to say that I would certainly stand with this church in its present battle. Um, the Methodists have gone increasingly, progressively, over the last 20 years, if not 25 years, in the direction of theological liberalism. Obviously, homosexual and lesbian ordination is the mainstay of the day, and of course, they become vehemently anti-Israel. And this church has had enough, and it has drawn the line, but it is in something of a legal and financial battle to get propriety of the premises. May the Lord give it to them. But I stand by this church. I thank the Lord for their integrity and standing, and I salute them for their stance. May the Lord bless them and give them the victory as well in Jesus. We're going to see more and more of this in the last days. We're going to see faithful churches unable to remain in backslidden denominations. You're going to see more and more faithful congregations who are loyal to the Lord on the basis of Scripture who will not be any longer able to remain in these movements or denominational systems. This is tragic. It's unfortunate. Most of these movements and denominations began with the gospel. Most of them began right. The Methodists certainly did. The Pentecostals certainly did. The Baptists certainly did. But they're all gravitating away from it or have else already gone away from it. It's going to be more and more difficult for faithful churches to stay in the false religious system of the world. That's what it is. And it's going to be more difficult for faithful Christians to stay in churches that have turned their back on the Lord because they turned their back on His Word. Come out of her, my people. If you can stay in and be a voice and a, a witness and an influence, Okay, if that's what God's telling you to do, do it. Take the stand, stand up and speak out. But realize the time is going to come when either you're going to win or you're going to be pushed out. <laughs> Hope for the former, expect the latter. There is going to be, as I've been saying for over 30 years, a schism between the true church and the apostate church. By the apostate church, I don't only mean the World Council of Churches, or Rome, or things, we've always known those were apostate. I mean backslidden evangelicism. Um, it's become almost unbelievable. If you don't know, the president of the Baptist, Southern Baptist Union in the United States, the largest evangelical denomination in the developed world, 
the Southern Baptist Union of the United States Conference. The president gave a keynote address to their national conference this year, saying that born again Christians must become the number one advocates and spokesmen for homosexual and lesbian rights. This is the Southern Baptist president, J.D. Greer. The born again Christians should stand up and be the number one spokesman for homosexuals. What rights are they denied? They have the right to adopt children and bring them up that way. They have a right to go into schools funded by taxpayers and teach your children and grandchildren that that lifestyle is normal. They have the right to that. They have the right to sue Christian bakeries for not making wedding cakes for same-sex marriages. They have the right to do that. And we're supposed to be there Spokesman for this. This is all over the world. It's not just Britain, it's America, it's Australia, it's everywhere. The Lord is indeed coming. And there must be, must be a split between the true church and the apostate church. There must be. Revelation 18.4, it is inevitable. Now, we happen to be in this church and it's happening here. But believe me, it's happening a lot more than here. It's happening all over the planet, and it's going to continue to happen. Things can never go back to be the way they were. Never, never. More Christians are going to be meeting in homes because they can't find churches. They're going to form house churches. That's the way it's going to have to be. Be that as it may, that's not our purpose today. I only mentioned it in passing. Please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking, first of all, this morning at the mini apocalypse of Isaiah. The mini apocalypse of Isaiah. But we'll begin by saying a few things about the book of Revelation, most of which most of you probably are already familiar with, but I'm doing it for the sake of first time visitors and for the recording. The book of Revelation is different in its literary genre than the rest of the New Testament. It's different, okay? It's different in various respects. One is, it is Judaic. Its themes, its symbolism are from the Old Testament. It takes Old Testament motifs and recycles them for the church in the last days. The Exodus, Jews in the Paschal Seder commemorate the judgments on Egypt, filling up a saucer, uh, which is called a cup, but it's a saucer, at the Passover meal, uh, recounting again the judgments on Egypt. Choshek, darkness, Thradaya, frogs, dam, blood, and you throw it out, counting these judgments. This corresponds to the cup of wrath being filled up in the book of Revelation. Those judgments that happened on Egypt with Moses are going to happen again to the kingdom of Antichrist in the last days. Uh, that's just one example. There are many examples. There are things from Ezekiel, from Isaiah, certainly from Zechariah and Daniel. The literary themes and motifs of the book of Revelation follow the Old Testament. They primarily follow the Old Testament. They don't read like the New. Now there are more than one reason for that. One reason is when the time of the Gentiles comes to a close, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and when the age of the church concludes with the close of the 69th week of Daniel's prophecy, God primarily turns his redemptive focus back to Israel and the Jews. Once the church, the faithful church, is removed, God is again dealing with Israel and the Jews in the Old Testament sense. The age of grace as we know it now will be over. He goes back to behaving the way he did in the Old Testament. A God of wrath, a God of judgment. Grace as we know it now comes to an end. Again, his focus goes back also dealing with Israel and the Jews, howbeit in the darkest hour of their long history. Okay. Now, there's something called apocalyptic literature, 
particularly 1st and 2nd Enoch and 1st and 2nd Maccabees, but above all 1st and 2nd Enoch. Enoch is quoted from, for instance, in the Epistle of Jude. It is not a basis of doctrine. It is not a basis of doctrine, but it is scripturally important history and literature. What it does, it shows us, from a literary perspective, how the book of Revelation was composed. You had apocalyptic literature with symbolic numbers, with, with animals being types or pictures of nations and things like this. We have these things in Daniel and Zechariah, elements of it in Isaiah, certainly Ezekiel. We have apocalyptic literature in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, okay? What the apocryphal literature, the intertestamental first and second Enoch do, is shows us how the Hebrew apocalyptic was put into the Greek language, okay? Was put into the Greek language for the predominantly Gentile church, whose lingua franca at the time was Greek, okay? For instance, uh, Sheol becomes Hades, things like that, okay? Leviathan becomes Apollyon, things of that nature, okay? So the book of Revelation is different than the rest of the New Testament from a literary perspective and also from a historical perspective. It's prophetic, but it is dealing with the church as it was at the end of the first century, as well as dealing with the church in the future. Um, let's look at a very familiar chapter from Revelation, one we've gone into in some depth before, but we're going to look at it a little bit differently today. Revelation chapter 12, please. There is nothing in the book of Revelation at least not from chapter 4 onwards, but even in chapters 1, 2, and 3. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that is not found in the Old Testament. Unless we understand the Old Testament, we cannot understand the book of Revelation. Okay. You must understand the Old Testament to understand the book of Revelation. Secondly, you must understand the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, things like that, and what the apostles say about the Olivet Discourse in 1 John and 2 Thessalonians, in 1 Timothy particularly, what the apostles say about Jesus' teaching about the last days. So it begins in the Old Testament. Unless you understand the Old Testament apocalypse, we cannot understand the New Testament apocalypse, which we translate the book of Revelation. Remember, in Greek, it's called apocalypsis. Apocalypsis simply means an unveiling. No new revelation. It's already there on back of the curtain. As we've said many times, as we get closer to the return of Jesus, for the faithful church, the curtain goes up they see more and more. For the apostate church, for the harlot church, the veil goes down. They will see less and less. As it says in Daniel, none of the wicked will understand. Remember, in the last days, understanding of Scripture becomes a barometer of faithfulness. The apostate church will understand less and less. The faithful under church will understand more and more. Either the veil is going to go up for you, or it's going to go down for you. Either the veil is going to go up for your church, or it's going to go down for your church. But it will not remain static. It will not remain static. It's either going up, or it's going to go down. Now, of course, we want it to go up. <laughs> Let's look at the 12th chapter. We've explained before multiple times, in fact we have a teaching on it, 
that the book of Revelation chapter 12 is a Pesher interpretation. Come on, let's get these folks in. Come on in, have a seat. The book of Revelation chapter 12 is a Pesher interpretation on the nativity narrative, on the birth of Jesus. It takes what happened in the nativity as recorded in Matthew and Luke and reframes it as a picture of what's going to take place in the last days. Let's begin looking at Revelation 12. My apologies to those who know this. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and under her, under, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now this resembles the vision of Joseph, doesn't it? Resembles the vision of Joseph. There was these crazy people that was, claimed they were saved, they claimed to be saved Christians, all over the internet a few years ago, saying that this prophecy was fulfilled September 23rd, 19, I'm sorry, September 23rd, 2017. Because in the horoscope, in the, the, the astrology zodiac, the moon was in Virgo. These were people who claimed to be saved Christians. That was their basis of interpreting this. And she cried out, being in labor, in pain to give birth. Okay. So you have a woman expecting a baby. That's imminent. There are birth pangs. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns on his head, were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. Again, Herod wanted to kill Jesus coming out of Mary so he could keep power. The Antichrist will try to preempt the rapture of the church because it's the body of Christ. Dominion will be given to the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.21. Now, all of this, or most of this, comes from Daniel. We see the seven heads and ten horns in Daniel. We see it here. But notice, Herod the Great personifies it. Herod the Great foreshadows it. If you want to know what the Antichrist is going to do, look at what Herod did. Again, my apologies to those who know this. Herod the Great was not a great guy. He was a prolific builder to impress the Romans. Ethnically, he was an Idumean. He was an Arab from Edom. He was an ethnic Arab. His religion, however, was Judaism. His citizenship, however, and his nationality was Roman. To the Romans, he was a Roman. To the Arabs, he was an Arab. To the Jews, he was a Jew. That teaches something about the Antichrist. One of the ways he is going to broker a false peace in the Middle East is everybody's going to think he's one of them. <laughs> well, in fact, he is one of them. At the same time, he's none of them. He's Satan's man. Again, I only mention this in passing for those who are not familiar with it. Most of you I know are. She gave birth to a son, a male child, set to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Remember the dominion is given to the saints of the Most High. Christ rules through his people. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. And there she would be nourished 1,260 days, half of the final seven years, the 70th week of Daniel. The story goes on and on, but we see a great sign appeared in heaven in verse 1, a great sign. Remember when Jesus came the first time, the Magi saw the sign in heaven. 
Uranus in Greek, Chelsea, so the Vulgate, but uh, Shemaim in Hebrew. They saw the sign. What did Jesus say when he comes back? Then they will see the sign in the sky, in the heavens, of the Son of Man. Okay? It'll be a sign in the celestial cosmos. Okay. Don't know it's him. Okay. The Magi knew it. The wise men knew the signs of his first coming. The wise men will know the sign of his second coming. Story goes on. The dragon tries to kill the baby. It doesn't work. Then he tries to kill the woman. Now let's look at this. Verse 13, when the dragon saw he was thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. When Satan is finally ev evicted, he enters the person of Antichrist. One of the reasons there will be a new heaven and a new earth is Satan will not have access to the new one. As we see in the book of Zechariah, he accuses before the throne. As we see in the book of Job, he accuses before the throne. As we see in Revelation, he gets evicted. He has access to the present heaven. He will not have access, access to the new one. Everybody understand? That is one of the reasons there will be a new one. Well, let's continue looking. He's cast down and he inhabits the person of the Antichrist. The child is rescued and he becomes enraged with the woman. Once the faithful church is removed, Satan through the person of Antichrist becomes obsessed with the extermination of Israel and the Jews. The return of Christ depends on the prophetic purpose of the faithful church. First he tries to kill the kid. Then he tries to kill the woman. It depends on the prophetic purposes of God for the faithful church and for Israel. And he tries to destroy both of them. When he fails to get rid of the church, he tries to get rid of the Jews. When the Jewish believers were rescued in 70 AD under Simeon, following the instructions of Jesus when Jerusalem was surrounded, the Romans went in and killed as many Jews as they could in Jerusalem. These are pictures of what Antichrist will do. Once the faithful church is gone, he goes after the Jews. There's a reason you see hatred of the church in the media, in universities, in, 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 the, in the Labor Party, and I'm not being political. You see this hatred of Christians, but you also see a rise of anti-Semitism and a hatred of Israel and the Jews following on its heels, don't you? This is exactly what happens. It goes back to Genesis 3.15, but that's not our topic today. So he goes nuts and tries to get rid of the woman. And it's the dragon. But then the dragon morphs into the serpent for times, time and a half time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured out water like a river that he might, uh, after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the rivers which the dragon poured out of his mouth. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children. What did Herod do after his plan to kill Jesus was foiled? He tried to intercept the birth of the Messiah. His plan was foiled. He goes back to Bethlehem and he kills all the male babies. You understand? He becomes enraged with the woman and the rest of her offspring. If you want to know what Antichrist is going to do, Look at what Herod did. Herod is the peshet, the simple. Antichrist is the pesher. We cannot understand Revelation 12 unless we understand Isaiah and the nativity narrative. Everyone understand? 
Now, let's talk just a little bit about natural disasters. Natural disasters. The increase in natural disasters in the last days, earthquakes, floods, famines, droughts, these things which are meteorologically and seismologically true, okay, they're, they're actual, increase because they represent things spiritual. We'll look more at this when we go to Isaiah. Famines. There'll be famines. Why? Because Amos says there'll be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Okay? That's what. An increase in floods in Derbyshire. There's always been floods, but not like now. Well, why is this happening? You should see some of the floods that happen in some countries. And the aftermath of the floods that, that, that takes place in the third world with the malaria. The larvae just goes ballistic. And the, why the increase in floods? Well, this is why. This increases we see in natural disasters are emblematic or representative of forces spiritual. You understand? That's why the natural disasters increase not only, but one of the reasons is they represent what's happening spiritually, okay? So, natural disasters increase. Now, God tries to use them to get people's attention that something is going wrong with the biosphere, that there's signs of the return of Christ, but there is a spiritual meaning on back of each one, you understand? And we'll look at some of those today. All right, let's continue now in Revelation 12. So we see this thing on the character of, of Daniel, personified by Herod, foreshadowing the Antichrist. The rescue of the baby, foreshadowing the rapture of the church. The dragon going after the woman, foreshadowing Satan's efforts through Antichrist to exterminate Israel once the faithful church is removed. But then we see a morphing of the dragon into the serpent. The morphing. Remember Satan's two modes of attack, dragon and serpent. Dragon is the persecutor, serpent is the deceiver. The serpent beguiled the woman. As Paul tells the Christians in Corinth, I fear for you lest you be beguiled, deceived by the devil the way the serpent deceived Eve. Men are spiritually insensitive. Women are spiritually hypersensitive. Men don't hear from the Lord as easily as women. On the other hand, men are not deceived as easily as women. Women are much more prone to spiritual seduction than men. Men have another problem. Okay, men's problem is they're not spiritual at all until God does something. Women Women can confuse emotion with spirituality much easier than men. Men can confuse intellect with spirituality much easier than women. You hear what I said? Men can confuse intellect with spirituality easier than women. Women can confuse emotion with spirituality easier than men. Now these things are a result of the fall, you understand? It's, it's not, it's not, we weren't created to be that way. We're that way because of the fall of nature. Men are messed up in one way, women are messed up in another. But because of the fall, we're all messed up and we all have an old nature. Now notice the dragon and the serpent. Serpent the deceiver, dragon the persecutor, but he morphs. Remember in the garden in Genesis, God curses the serpent to crawl on its stomach. Obviously it was a biped or a quadruped. Obviously the thing could walk. Okay? No, I don't believe dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. I've, I've, I've told people, I've been to the, I, I saw one in Las Vegas once, but I've seen them in the 
Taronga Zoo in Sydney, Australia. I'm telling you, what dinosaur means is a great and terrible lizard. That's what it means. I have seen a dinosaur. I have seen the Kamada dragon. It's 22 feet long. It can eat a human. <laughs> its saliva is so bacterially infectious. You'll die from the bite just from the saliva. And the thing is, it, 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 you don't mess with them. I've, I'd like to take a Darwinist and throw him over the fence. Now tell me it became extinct 65 billion years ago. That takes the junk out of you. It's unbelievable. The thing that God cursed could walk. Notice the dragon in Genesis morphed into a serpent, right? In Revelation, you see the same thing. The dragon morphs into a serpent. Civilizations from North American Indians to Mexico, to Arab culture, Middle East, Africa, China, all of them have cave inscriptions and drawings of dragons. All of them knew there were dinosaurs. No, they were not all these millions. <laughs> they all knew about these. They were obviously hunted into extinction, except for that Kamada dragon. God left us one dinosaur. <laughs> just to prove that they're not extinct. If you ever get a chance to see one, have a look at it. It's incredible. I guess you can get clips of it on the YouTube or something. But you wouldn't want to mess with one of them. Anyway, the dragon and the serpent. Notice it morphs. Okay? Now that's just, for our purposes today, a very brief overview of Revelation 12. Not all of it, just the aspects we're going to deal with today. How do we begin to interpret this in light of the Old Testament? Unless we understand the Old Testament, we won't understand the New. Unless we understand the Hebrew Scriptures, what we just read in Revelation, won't work. Now remember, the woman the birth pangs, the natural disasters, the dragon, the serpent, the monster, you know, the, 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 all of these things, okay? Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 26. Verse 8. Indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. For the faithful church, for the faithful believers, for the faithful remnant of Israel who are believing Jews, saved Jews, okay. for the faithful, okay, when the judgments of God increase and they understand it is indicative of his return. Okay. They wait eagerly. They have learned, in spite of the terrible things, even the persecution which besets them, to lift up their head, the redemption draws near. Okay. We've waited eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. Your memory is the desire of our souls. Now let's look at verse 9. Look at it very carefully. At night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgments, 
the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. When these judgments increase, my soul longs for you. My spirit within me seeks for you diligently. Where else do we see that phraseology in Scripture? <coughs> it's straight out of the Song of Solomon, isn't it? Remember, Jesus takes the Song of Solomon, which was going to be read in the synagogue the following Saturday. And he takes that from the Hebrew liturgy, from the Machzor of of. of Yam Rishon of Hag, of, I'm sorry, of Shabbat of Hag Matzot, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's still read in the synagogues to this day. In his day, it would have been read in the temple, the Song of Solomon. And he applies it to himself. The Song of Solomon is based on two dreams, chapter 3 and chapter 5. In chapter 3, the bride is longing for the bridegroom to come, and he comes, and she's ready, and they go off and live happily ever after. In chapter 5, he comes. She doesn't want to get out of bed. He knocks, and he goes. Okay? The wise and foolish virgins. Jesus took what's going to be read in the synagogue that Saturday, and he says, my return is going to be that way. The bridegroom comes in the night. Things get very dark at the end of the age. And it's going to be your best dream or your worst nightmare. Now we have other tapes explaining this in depth. But turn with me, if you will, to the Song of Solomon. Hashir Hashirim. Chapter 3. On my bed, night after night, I sought him and my soul loves. I sought him, but I didn't find him. I must arise now, go about the city and the streets, in the squares. I must seek him and my soul loves. I sought him, but I didn't find him. Notice she is desperately wanting him to come. She knows he's coming. She knows he's coming in the night. She knows his coming is getting closer. She lives in anticipation of his return. But when, when, when are you coming? Is it? The watchman, as it were, the police who make the rounds in the city, found me. And I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I left them. When I found him whom my soul loves, I held on to him and would not let go of him until I brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. Now this is a poetic allusion to consummation of Solomon's marriage to Shulamit, representative of Christ in the church. We know from the gender and the number in Hebrew what the bridegroom is singing, what the bride is singing, and what the witnesses to the romance are singing. They correspond to Tzeva Ota Shemaim, the host of heaven. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, <coughs> by the hinds of the field, you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. That's the continual refrain. Do not awaken her until she pleases. Remember, we are not waiting for the return of Jesus. He is waiting for us. It says in Peter, we can hasten his coming. Jesus said in Luke directly, when the crop permits, the Lord of the harvesters sends the harvesters. Don't awaken it as she pleases. It's when the crop permits. Okay? That's when it happens. When the crop permits. Ah. Uh, I assume he knows now in eternity in heaven. But when he was here, even Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Because relative to us, it's a variable. You understand? Relative to us, it's a variable. Eternity is like watching the parade from the top of the tall building. If you're on the top of the tall building, you can see the beginning of the parade. 
the middle of the parade and the end of the parade simultaneously. <laughs> My friend Chuck Missler used to explain this this way. He was good at it. But if you're standing down on the pavement watching the parade go by, you only see the chronology. First there was a marching band, and then there was this, and then there was that, and then you know, there was some floats. You only get to see one thing at a time if you're down terrestrially on the ground watching the parade. But if you're up on top of the building, you see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Okay. We could only see from here. The book of Revelation, however, is written from the perspective of being on top of the building. You understand? It's not, John was told, come up hither. It's not written from our perspective. It's written from the perspective of eternity. Past, present, and future are all the same. The beginning of the parade, the middle of the parade, and the end of the parade. It's, well, there's a, there's a chronology, but there's, it's all simultaneous. Eternity is like that. I saw the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. There's no kairos, there's no clock, there's only kernels, an order of events like in a dream. But it's outside of time. The book of Revelation, apocalyptic literature, is written from the perspective of watching the parade from the top of the building, not from street level. Everybody understand? The return of Christ, standing on street level, we don't know when the float is going to come. <laughs> we don't know which marching band is going to precede it. We don't know. Let's see what happens next. But if you're on top of the building, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. It's from the eternal perspective. When the crop permits. When the crop We're not waiting for Jesus. He's waiting for us. Hasten his coming. He's coming for a spotless bride. Through evangelism and discipleship. Through missions and evangelism and discipleship. Through, through, through moral living. <laughs> we can make him come faster. By living our lives the way we're supposed to and doing the things we're supposed to, we can actually make him come faster. Don't awaken my beloved until she pleases. No man in his right mind wants a woman who doesn't want him. Just think of sex criminals, these guys who rape women, and these guys are sickos. No normal male, no psychological, even an unsaved male, no normal male would ever want a woman who didn't want him. The male ego is too fragile. A normal male would never want the woman who doesn't want him. Sex criminals are freaks. They're sickos. There's something wrong with them. Okay. Well, <laughs> Jesus is not a freak. He wants a bride who wants him. <laughs> so that's chapter 3. <laughs> He knocks, she's all ready to go. Chapter 5, it's the foolish virgins. We know what happens. Let's look at Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Again, most of you are familiar with this, but we have to do it because it's in the context. Verse 1, I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh, which is what bodies were anointed with, corpses, along with my balsam. I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Now the gender changes to the female in the Hebrew canon. She says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. 
for my head is drenched with the dew, my locks with the damp of the night. Remember, he always comes in the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Work while we have the light. Night will come. No man can work. It gets very dark before he comes. Spiritually, morally, etc. Let's look. He's knocking. I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I soil them? In? Not tonight, Jesus. I have a headache. Chapter 3, she's all dressed and ready. Chapter 5, <laughs> do we have to do this tonight? Do we have to get married now? She's taken off her garment. Remember when Peter heard the call, it is the Lord, he put his garment on before he dived over, dove overboard? The garments of salvation. He covered me with the garments of salvation, clothed me with the robes of righteousness. Again, most of you know this stuff. She puts on her wedding garment. My beloved extended his hand through the opening and my feelings were roused for him. I arose to open to my beloved. My hands drip with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. Now notice she is anointed for burial, not him. I opened, but my beloved had turned and gone away. My heart went out to him. As he spoke, I searched for him and did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. The foolish virgins are going nowhere, and they are going nowhere fast. They don't have the oil in the lamps to see in the night. They'll trip over their own feet. The watchman who makes the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. What is going to happen to the unraptured? Draw your own conclusions. Notice he's knocking. The last of the seven churches, what's he doing? Let me in, let me in. Laodicea doesn't want to let him in. It's the church of people's opinions, people's rights. They don't want the real, they want their own Jesus. <laughs> they don't want their, they're not going to let him in. He's knocking, but they don't get in. He doesn't get in. So, in the mini apocalypse of Isaiah, we see the same thing. The faithful or longing for him in the night, seeking him diligently, just like Shulamit was seeking Solomon diligently in chapter 26, verse 9. Verse 10, though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord, though the wicked is shown favor. The Lord is slow to anger. He's slow to anger. I once had a case where I was coming back from Northern Ireland by ferry, and the day I got to Scotland, that crazy guy, Hamilton, shot those kids in Dunblane. And the following Sunday, I was on my way to speak at a church in Warrington in the north of England. And I put on the memorial service for the kids on the radio as I was driving from Leeds, where I lived at the time, to, to Warrington on the M62. And the Presbyterian Church of Scotland minister comes out and he begins the service, the memorial service, for the kids who got shot. And they understood that was something that only used to happen in America. Once it, happen, it happened in Britain, people freaked out. They thought that kind of stuff was American then. 
Columbine was the States, but now what happened in Britain? And uh, the guy comes out, the vicar, without the minister, oh God, our father and our mother. <laughs> I just switched it off. I don't want to hear it. So I get to Warrington. This guy brought his unsaved friend to hear me speak. He'd been trying to witness and share his faith with his unsaved friend. And his unsaved friend stayed after the service to talk to me. I invited any non-believers to talk to me after the service, which I frequently do. And he comes up and he says to me, something you've all heard, or some version of this, he says to me, if your God is so powerful, so great and such a God of love, words to that effect, how could he have let those kids get shot in Dunblane this week? If I was a God of love, I would have loved those children. I would have stopped that guy from murdering those kids. How can your God, if he's so powerful, have let that happen? If he's a God of love, how could your God have let that happen? Why didn't he do something? So I said to him, First of all, don't blame my God for what your God does. Your God was a murderer from the beginning. My God said Satan is the God of this world. My God is not the God of this world. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. This is your God. This is the God you serve. Don't blame my God for what your God did. Now, my God is indeed a God of love, and he's all-powerful. And he is going to intervene and put an end to evil. He is going to intervene and put an end to evil. But let me tell you why he hasn't done it already. Because he loves you. And if he put an end to evil, he'd have to put an end to you. He's giving you a chance to repent and believe the gospel. He tarries because of his love. Even when Jesus was here, he was fed up. He says, I wish it was already lit, remember? He said he wishes it was already lit. Uh, his judgment, he wishes it was already lit. Uh, flame of judgment. He's holding out for people to get saved. But unsaved people see this. They think they're getting away with the abortion and the, the, the divorce when there's no reason. They, they think they're getting away with these things. God shows them grace, and to them, grace just becomes something to take advantage of to think they can continue doing it. Now, that's the world. The grace of God is designed to bring people to repentance. In the present apostasy, we have people like Joseph Prince from Singapore teaching hypergrace. He's basically teaching licentiousness. He says once we accept Christ, that's it, we don't have to repent anymore. I guess he never read the seven churches in Revelation. <laughs> Hyper grace is just licentiousness. But he's a popular preacher. He's the Asian partner of the American Joel Osteen. And people think he's great. He's a liar from hell. Well, unsaved people are going to be like that, but so will the world. Though the wicked are shown favor, they don't learn righteousness. Verse 11. Oh, they don't perceive his majesty. Oh, Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. They see your zeal for the people and are put to shame. Indeed, fire will devour your enemies. These people do not know or perceive that the judgment of God is impending. They do not perceive his judgment is impending. Then it continues. Lord, you will establish peace for us. O say shalom bimrumav. Since you have also performed for us all our works. 
Notice he performs all our works. Things we do in the flesh, even with good motives, don't count. It's only what the Lord does through us. It's not our righteousness, it's his. O oh Lord, other masters other than you have ruled over us. It is true the world is in the power of the wicked one. But through you alone we confess your name. The dead will not live, the departed spirits will not rise. Therefore you have punished and destroyed them and wiped out all remembrance of them. Verse 14, they will not live, the departed spirits will not rise. Look with me please to Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4, I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Remember, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the Word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You see that. The people who take the mark of the beast will not be in the resurrection of the righteous. Do not believe the false teaching of John MacArthur. I don't care how respected he is. Among his many other errors, this teaching that you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved and go to heaven is a lie of the devil. Do not believe or trust John MacArthur. It's those who did not worship the beast came to life. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Do you see? Their spirits do not rise. They do not. That's what Isaiah is saying. They're not going to be here for the millennial reign of Christ. It's not going to happen. The dead will not live. The departed spirits will not rise. Therefore, you've punished and destroyed them. You've wiped out all remembrance of them. What does that mean? Again, in case you don't know, I'll go through it quickly. What grieves us, perhaps, more than anything, is coping with the death of unsaved loved ones, unsaved family, parents, husbands, children, God forbid, whatever, siblings, emotionally and spiritually coping with the death of unsaved loved ones plagues every one of us. Unless you're a very fortunate person, a very fortunate person, and everybody in your family is a saved Christian, unless you're a very, very fortunate person, you've had to deal with this issue at some time on some level. Every one of us. This is probably the most difficult thing we have to come to terms with. The Lord will take away every tear. We know that. But how? They are not annihilated. There is nothing in Scripture that teaches annihilation. The smoke of their torment goes up, and now tau and yau nice. Again, do not believe the teaching of the late John Stott or of Roger Foster. They're not annihilated. What is annihilated is our remembrance of them. We will not know they ever existed. We may know that there were such people, but we will have no personal recollection of any of them. God will annihilate our remembrance of unsaved people. We won't know them in any personal sense at the resurrection. He takes away every tear. It'll be like somebody who died that you never met and they died before you were born. Well, you can't really grieve or mourn over them. You might know there was such people, but 
That's all. You might know there was such family, but you won't know who they were. The Lord will obliterate, He will annihilate our memory of them. They're not annihilated, but our memory of them will be annihilated. How can God cause us to forget this? Well, it's simple. If God is so powerful and so sovereign that for the sake of His own Son, He can cause Himself to forget our sin. God actually, for the sake of His Son Jesus, gives Himself a case of amnesia regarding our sin. All the bad stuff we did, He actually, for the sake of His Son, causes Himself to forget it happened. That's amazing, isn't it? That God can give Himself a case of amnesia? He's so powerful, He can cause Himself to forget? Well, if for the sake of His Son, He can cause Himself to forget our sin, how much easier is it going to be for Him to cause us to forget something? <laughs> That'll be like nothing. That'll be like nothing. <laughs> For him, it's just nothing. <laughs> to forget our sin, it caused him the death of his son. He doesn't forget that. But he forgets the sin. He forgets the sin. If he can make himself forget, he'll have no trouble making us forget. He will take away every tear. Yes, it grieves us now, but it will not grieve us when Jesus returns. Everybody understand? Christians go, how can I enjoy eternity and the millennium and being with the Lord knowing that my husband or my wife or my, is, is in hell? You know, how can I enjoy the blessing? It's not going to be, a, you won't remember them. Now it becomes Judeo-centric. It begins dealing with Israel prophetically in verse 15. You've increased the nation, O Lord. You've increased the nation. You are glorified. You've extended all the borders of the land. Now this will take place, of course, during the millennial reign of Christ. O Lord, they sought you in distress. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. <sighs> Two aspects of this. The church becomes so backslidden and worldly that persecution becomes a necessary evil to clean it up. It is only those who don't need to be persecuted who get it first and worst. But it separates the wheat from the chaff. But with Israel it's the same. He will bring them into the time of Jacob's trouble a desperate hour when they will, in desperation, call out to him. Now let's look at this. Verse 17, as the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she rises and calls out in her labor. Thus we were before you, O Lord. We were pregnant, we writhed in labor. We gave birth as it seems only to wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were the inhabitants of the world born. Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Notice, the resurrection is called the earth giving birth. You see that? The earth giving birth. Remember, the two most common illustrations of what it's going to be like before the rapture always come from seismology and obstetrics. Always seismology and obstetrics. Seismologically, the geologists tell us that tectonic plates begin to shift. 
you know, you see this in the New Zealand and Japan and California. Is this the big one or is this the tremor? But you know, sooner or later, those tectonic plates are really going to shift and it's going to be a major earthquake. I was just in Christchurch, New Zealand recently. That place is never going to recover. I remember what it was like before the earthquake. I saw that whole city was destroyed. That whole city. Christchurch, New Zealand looked more like England than any other city in the world outside of England. It was the most English, not British, but English looking city. If you couldn't see the Cook Mountains in the distance, you would swear you were in England. It looked exactly like England. And it's a sizable place. And the whole thing is just an earthquake. Totally, direct, I couldn't recognize. I knew my I knew my way around the city center. You couldn't find anything. Just unbelievable. I was just there again recently. It just just forget it. Well, it's an earthquake. It's a tremor, but then an earthquake. So it is with birth pangs. There may be interim periods of respite during maternal contractions. They can ease up for a bit, but it is an interim period of respite. It is a false conclusion to think that the birth pangs are over. They're going to come back with greater intensity until ultimately the baby's born. Now, turn with me to John 16, please. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away. Think of the baby being born. Nobody in their right mind looks forward to maternal labor, to the contractions. Nobody. But once the joy of a healthy baby is there and the obstetrician or the midwife hands the baby to the mother, everything is forgotten. There's only joy. When you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. But the birth pangs are there. Now there's two things we have to understand. In obstetrics, if maternal labor goes on more than 24 hours, and it becomes a fear of moral hypoxia to the fetus or proclampsia or something like that, obstetrician says, that's it. We're going to do a cesarean section. We'll go on in and get the kid out. We can't let this mother continue to go through these contractions. The rapture will be a divine cesarean section. The Greek term is kolobo, kolobo. It is a surgical term. Those days had been cut short. You understand? For the sake of the elect, he cuts it short. The baby will be born by Caesarean section. It'll be the rapture. The baby will be harpezod, snatched away. He goes in and gets the kid. You understand? He goes in and forcibly gets the kid and puts an end to the maternal pain. Okay, now, this goes back to the late 1940s. Unfortunately, today they've mixed it and corrupted it with yoga, but it began with things called Le Mans. 
and they would get these midwives or maternity nurses who were mothers themselves that already had at least one baby, and they would be midwives who already had a baby themselves, and they would be the teachers of these classes where there would be stretching exercises and breathing exercises, and the husbands would sometimes take the classes with the wife to encourage the wife through it, breathe, push, breathe, push, all this kind of stuff, how to, you know, just increasingly put pressure on the pubic arch that it will, gonna, it's gonna have to extend more than it normally is in its anatomical position to get the kid out. And this is what's going to, and they explain the anatomy and they show films of childbirth and things like this. And these were the courses. And they had other ones. Le Mans was one of the main ones in the States. I'm not sure in this country. But these courses were statistically proven to help, particularly with the first baby. The women who did these courses had lower instances of requiring cesarean sections and things like that than the other ones. It was statistically documented medically that these courses actually help people. They knew what was coming, they knew, they knew what to expect, and they got through the labor easier than the women who didn't. And this was statistically proven over a number of generations. Well, suppose you get some bimbo who thinks that a baby is born umbilically, <laughs> there's not gonna be any contractions or birth pangs. There's not gonna be any labor. It's just gonna pop out umbilically. Huh? Don't tell me about labor. I'm not concerned about the labor. I'm not concerned about the contractions. I'm just concerned about the baby. You, you women going to these courses, you're looking forward to the labor. I'm looking forward to the baby. <laughs> Sounds profound? What does it sound stupid? <laughs> Everyone's looking forward to the baby. But if you think that kid's gonna pop out umbilically, you're not a mother, you're a bimbo. You're looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. You're expecting tribulation. I'm expecting rapture as if the two are mutually exclusive. After the tribulation of those days, the Lord will send the harvesters. Ah, you'll have tribulation in the world. No, we won't. When do you get this? The Episunagage are gathering together to be with him will not come until you know who the man of lawlessness is. You have to know who the Antichrist is. Oh, you're looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. Lady, let me tell you something. There's contractions. Then the water bursts. Then you can see the baby's head and get the kid out. If it gets medically too complicated, they begin to try to manage it with epidurals. If the epidurals don't help, they can elect to go for a cesarean section. That's the way it happens. It doesn't happen the way you think. The kid does not pop out umbilically. How can you talk sense to somebody who believes that? We're not gonna suffer. We're gonna be raptured at it. You understand what they're doing. See the Bible in your lap, right? The Bible, the Bible in the English language. It's free to us to meet here, and we've got this. It cost William Tyndale his life. 
This cost the Lolas, the followers of John Wycliffe, it cost them their lives. This freedom we have was bought in this country, in England. It was bought by the blood of martyrs. The freedom we have in the Protestant democracies was bought by the blood of martyrs. We are not immune from the persecution that Christians have in so many countries today, in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, just because we live in Britain or America or Canada. This freedom was bought by the blood of martyrs, by people who were persecuted here. What they do is they reinterpret scripture in light of their own experience in a Protestant democracy, oblivious to the fact that democracy itself is now disappearing because we've turned away from the biblical principles that gave it to us. Well, let's see what happens. Pregnancy. Now look at Romans 1 very briefly. I'm sorry, Romans 8, Romans 8. Verse 18, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed, just like maternal labor. Once the baby's there, you forget the contractions. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. When man fell, the creation fell. You see that? The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery and corruption into the freedom of the glory of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together. Not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, the physical resurrection. Notice the creation is having birth pangs. Do you see how it applies the language of maternal labor to the earth? When Jesus died, there was an earthquake, wasn't there? And the Old Testament saints were seen walking around Jerusalem, remember? That earthquake is the final push when the earth gives birth. The reason there's an increase in earthquakes and, and higher on the Richter scale in their intensity, the increase in seismic activity is indicative of the fact that the resurrection is coming. You understand? The earth is having birth pangs. The resurrection itself is coming. Floods, famines, all of these natural disasters increasing have a spiritual meaning on back of them. Earthquakes are to the earth, whether dead or buried, to what birth pangs are to an expectant mother. The earth is pregnant, as it were. Now, of course, Hinduism has a corrupted version of this with the mother earth thing. We understand that. But we're talking scripturally. Okay, we have to move on now. We only have a few minutes. Come, my people, enter into your rooms. Verse 20, close the door after you, hide until the indignation runs its course. Work while you have the light, night will come, no man can work. Okay. Is my battery on? Okay. Work while you have the light, 
Night will come, no man can work. The Lord is about to come from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will reveal her bloodshed and no longer cover her slain. The day of the Lord will be Christ returning in judgment. First the church is raptured, rescued. When he returns, it's to bring judgment. This is the day of the Lord. Now you have no chapter divisions in the Hebrew canon. Look at verse 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, Leviathan, the modern Hebrew word for a whale, but the ancient Hebrew word for a monster. Translated Apalion, the destroying monster in Revelation. The Lord will punish the Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with the fierce and great mighty sword. Even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. Do you see that? Once again, you have the dragon and the serpent. Same as in Genesis, same as in Revelation. The sea, remember? The Antichrist is the beast who came out of the sea. And the, the false prophet from, you know, one from the earth, one from the sea. The false prophet corresponds more to the serpent, the Antichrist more to the dragon. But I only mentioned that briefly in passing. They're all Antichrist, they're all from Satan. Even Leviathan, the twisted serpent. That's what's going to happen. The Lord will judge, destroy the fleeing serpent. He will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. He will destroy the Antichrist. That's Isaiah 26. That is Isaiah 26. That is also Revelation 12, exactly. You cannot understand Revelation 12 unless you understand certain other things. Yes, the nativity narrative, for sure. Yes, Daniel, for sure. But the mini apocalypse of Isaiah is foundational. It is fundamental to understanding not only what is going to happen, but the order in which these events will transpire. Everyone understand? Let's have a break.